Um, we are here to talk about Marnie's book. So today with us, we have Marnie Joel, that is a conflict mediator and facilitator and the program head of the program here at Federal Road, Conflict Analysis and Management. We also have Amanda Ripley joining us from the state, American journalist and author who cover high profile topics for the time and other outlets. And she also contributes to the Atlantic. So thank you, uh, Marnie and Amanda for being with us. And before I pass it over um, to Marnie and Amanda for a rich conversation, we'll be together for about 45 minutes. I just want to acknowledge that Trail World University is on the traditional lands of the Lakwagan and Kosapsan nations and ancestors, known as the families of the Esquimal and Sunhees. This statement means that we at Railroad recognize the importance of indigenous and non-indigenous people relationship as we continue to learn to understand the history, present and future scopes of indigenous people. If you know the indigenous, indigenous land you are joining us from today, please use the chat option to share it. And over to you, Marnie and Amanda. Well, welcome everybody. This just feels like a joyful celebration to have um, Amanda here. Amanda is an honored guest with us for Royal Roads. And uh, so I would like to myself just recognize where I really am situated um, in the near a, a tree that's making the oxygen for me that I'm not able to breathe and to think about the people who came before and who stewarded the land uh, so for my case, it's the Wasanich people on which they, there was Gary Oaks that were grown here and cultivated in relationship. And so um, I think about that as a way of helping connect me to the people who stewarded the land before me with, um, and recognize the history of dispossession and, and violence that also led me to be here. And then to think forward to the different kinds of relationships that we're gonna be talking about today um, in what are new possibilities for changing into different relationships with people and with the land that um, will help carve new systems um, that are more liberating than oppressive. So may it be so. And uh, Amanda, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. And I want to really um, say that you're here because of uh, uh, another member of my community, Lee Hamilton, who Connected, uh, connected me when I first met with her to say there's a lot of overlap and interconnection between um, some of our approaches to this work and then also some differences. And so that's what my hope is to um, explore some of that as we get started. So would you like to introduce yourself as well and your amazing book? Sure, thank you, Marnie, and thank you, Lee, for connecting us. It's good to see your name here on this chat. Um, I met Lee, I think it was four or five years ago now at my first mediation training retreat um, with Gary Friedman, who's featured in um, the book that I had come out last year. So um, I learned everything I know that's useful about conflict from mediators. I know a lot that's not helpful, as we all do, uh, about conflict just from life and lessons um, that I maybe shouldn't have learned uh, or learned the wrong way. But um, so I'm very grateful to be here with you and to, to be in conversation with everyone here. Um, I'm a journalist, not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm eager to learn. I, uh, I write a lot about political polarization and uh, political conflict and political violence and uh, like to learn from inter personal conflict and and try to be helpful to um, people who work in politics by helping them understand a little bit more about um, how the conflict is driving um, the politics more often than the other way around. <laughs> so yeah, good to be here. Yeah, Amanda, so that really starts us off um, with, uh, first of all, to also recognize like the importance of good mediators. And I too learned most of what I know from one of the people in the room here from, from Cheryl Burkard and Ken Melchin who connected the theory and the practice. But it, it is, it's uh, to honor also like who, who has taught us the things that we know is also, I think really important to, um, to, to recognize that we don't do this on our own. And, 
and where I'd like to start us with is that um, that in in my book, in the Anatomy of Everyday Arguments, I really recognize that conflict is a behavior, and so it's not only the fight impulses or the behaviors that you talk about. There are also the the freeze responses or the flight or the fawning, that ingratiating response. And so when I I think it's useful to talk about conflict as behavior because then it becomes able to, we become able to think about decision-making and then think about threats. And the threats can be, as you've talked about, that threat to identity or sense of self or the practical threats. And I think looking at conflict as behavior can be really helpful that it then isn't something, although you talk about how conflict takes over, it's those patterns of interaction. And it also, to me, seems that in being able to talk about conflict as behavior, it can explain some of the freeze behavior that I think can also fuel polarization that you talk about so much. And that freezing itself is a kind of defend behavior against the threat of potential shame or other kinds of harmful consequences. So I'm wondering if we could explore that a little bit more about um, threat and defend as conflict behaviors and that pattern of interaction as you see it from where you it. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I tend to kind of think about these things in stories as opposed to um, more abstract, you know, academic ideas, although I know that both are important. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that's been valuable to me as a journalist writing about conflict is to appreciate how how much of conflict is driven by um, by emotion, which is probably obvious to most people here. But you know, when you read coverage of political conflict, there's very little coverage of the psychology and emotions involved in the politicians themselves. Whereas I increasingly find when I work with members of Congress or even you know state and local politicians or school board members. Um, all of whom I'm hearing from a lot, as you probably are too. Uh, uh, it, it's almost entirely driven by emotion at this point. And so it's feelings of fear, of contempt, of um, not belonging, a fear of not belonging, of humiliation, disrespect, dignity violations. Like these things are just way more important in understanding the behavior, right, uh, that is conflict than than most of the things I read about in the newspaper. So um, I don't know. So I feel like the general literacy level, like conflict literacy level among um, most journalists and most people I know is pretty low. Um, mm. So then the question is how do we help to like raise this so people understand conflict dynamics better? So it mm. doesn't feel so you know, you talk in your book about the, the way things get so contracted, right? When you're in a conflict where you really, you literally do lose your peripheral vision uh, and figuratively. So you miss a lot of things. And so how do we help people understand the universality of those responses so that it's not such a trap? Mm. I think stories are really that key to mm, being able to um, really have the sort of have the, the narrative and the complexity and all of the magic that stories animate in us. Um, that I, I, that's why I think the four vignettes in my book are really the core of the, of the story. And what I loved about writing them is being able to track the inner process, which is very difficult to do in any other forum because uh, sometimes a moment of conflict takes a couple of pages to actually write all of the complexity of feeling both angry and fearful and outraged all at the same time in various ways. And when the narratives start flowing through about how could they possibly think that she would be, that, that, that sometimes the narratives come and then the feelings come. So having all of that in the, in the writing, um, that's what I love about the story and being able to tell the inner story and then explore other people's inner stories because of having access to that, I think is very, um, is yeah. really rich. I love how you did that in the book because it's like you gave us a play-by-play, -play, like uh, sports center level like, <laughs> analysis of what happened. And 
And I love that, you know, it was actually the, like, so the first, maybe this would be a good time to maybe if you don't mind sort of telling that story of the first conflict that you describe over cleaning, um, which is actually one of maybe the oldest conflicts <laughs> in, in all relationships. Uh, so, you know, anytime we have a conflict in a relationship that happens over and over, we know there's probably what I call the understory. There's a deeper story there. And if we don't get to it, we're just doomed to repeat the same boring argument over and over. Um, but getting to it is really hard. So I love how you kind of slowed it down and went moment by moment through your own and not every, you know, most people, this is what I mean. Most people can't access that. Like, and that's where we have to, I think, help people. Um, well, one way to help them is to show them what it looks like. So uh, would you mind telling that story about coming around the corner and sure. what you saw? Sure. Um, so I'll just read a little bit of it. So one Saturday, I come around the corner to discover Georgine industriously applying a harsh smelling chemical to the mirror. I have felt an uneasy acceptance of our agreement, which involved use vinegar, unless it's a really big problem with mold, and then you can use the toxic chemical. And now here she is using a strong cleaner on a smudged mirror. My annoyance erupts. Why are you using the vinegar? I reproach her in an accusing tone. What do you mean, she retorts. If you want to use vinegar, go ahead. But I'm the only one who does cleaning around here. I do plenty of cleaning, I rejoin. And when you clean, use the stupid vinegar, vinegar like you said. I look at her. Annoyance is not really the word for how I feel. I'm tight in my chest and throat, a churning feeling rising inside. She's missing my point about the cleaner and how I thought it would be used. And she's accusing me of slothfulness, laziness, and ingratitude all at the same time. I am defending in a very attacking sort of way. I love this. And, and the backstory for those of you who don't know is that, you know, you and Georgine, I think, had had a long standing for years. So how many years had this conflict come up in different? Over ways? 10. Over 10. Okay. So about, you know, how to clean, what to clean with. And it seems like your preference, if I have this right, was to use more natural, less abrasive, less harsh, less harmful chemicals, both for the environment and for your own health. Um, is that right? Yep. Okay. And then her preference was to use the things that uh, are much more effective in getting things cleaner, even if they're more harmful. She's fighting that... mold. She's eradicating the dangers. She's, of... yeah. yeah. She's saving the... She's, right. you're saving the planet she's yeah. saving the planet from germs yes, that's right. <laughs> so okay um and so you you see this you know clear violation of the non-aggression pact that you had established <laughs> because she's using i assume windex or something harsh to clean a small thing which is a mirror smudge um and so then you kind of slow it down for us and uh and and tell us what happened next but what what's the delightful surprise in this conflict is that you got interrupted. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us who interrupted you and what happened? Well, then, then my our very good friend Rebecca calls. And as she calls, I like she just says, Hi, how are you? And I say, Why does Georgine keep using all those cleaners on the mirror? She's a toxicologist. She should know better. And Rebecca says, Well, I'm kind of with you on that one. And then Georgine gets on the other line. And she says, Rebecca, why am I the only one who cleans around here? I feel ridiculous now, like we're two kids paddling to a mother, but I can't help it. I talked through the phone to Georgine. Yeah, you do a lot of cleaning, but not all of it. And I say, and Rebecca, I don't get that. She's a toxicologist. She studied that stuff. I can hear Rebecca smile, pause, breathe. Yep, she says, and her tone is accepting, almost resigned. It's that family of origin shit, you know, she says to me. <laughs> so, so what could have been actually a really unpleasant turn, like I felt myself getting a little nervous when I'm reading this and your friend calls, she doesn't know, she's walking into this. No, nobody likes to walk into the middle of a domestic conflict, <laughs> nobody. Uh, and, and now you've put her on the spot, right? And now Georgine's on the other end. So God bless landlines. <laughs> Thank God you still had one or none of this would have happened. And, and so now it's like, oh my God, she's judge and jury, the whole thing. Um, and she handled it really well. And, it, and to your credit also, and Georgine's credit, it, you were able to take in what she was saying and it kind of interrupted this spiral, it sounds like. Why, this wasn't the first time that you knew 
that Georgine brought some baggage to this party, right? So what happened there for you internally? So the change happened was, what I think is really significant about this, Amanda, is that um, before the call with Rebecca, my narrative went like, she's not able to get over that. Why can't she? It was her family of origin, but she's a toxicologist. She should be able to get it. And then after the call, because I, I, I instead of the grievance that I, I felt tolerance, because what happened was when after Rebecca said it's her family of origin shit, Georgine says, yeah, I got into a lot of trouble if I didn't clean, if things weren't spotless. And so for Georgine, where a lot of trouble means is that someone was likely to get hit. And so that opened in me the sense of compassion. And for me, it was also significant because it was no new information was exchanged in that whole dialogue, but something had opened for me in a shift. And that for me is valuing. It's a significant, it's a shift in significance so that she was no longer seen as kind of weak, but that she was doing her best to be able to engage with something that really mattered to her, that she was actually protecting. And so in that way, this, 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 the, the, the binary, as you talk about it, that sense of like either good or bad really opened up to be able to have my own sense of tolerance and compassion for my own discomfort expand. And what I think is important in this too, Amanda, is that this was actually, um, uh, uh, this is a, re a significant revision of my dissertation. And the person who was my external examiner was Andrea Bartoli, who's a expert in genocide and has deep roots in helping to broker peace in Mozambique. And he really appreciated the book in its four sequences of going from the simple domestic to what turns out to be a very complex multi-party mm. dispute. And he said, yes, I, so like, can you, can you help me as part of the examiner's questions of how to move from that kind of like, yeah, cleaning products to questions of genocide. And from his own work, it's very clear that it is individual acts of shift into those more tolerant spaces, which we can't will, I cannot will myself into more compassion, but through that active engagement, something that the curiosity within me, there was some kind of compassionate space that Rebecca opened up in me that enabled me to transcend in some way. And so there's countless stories of uh, stories that I, I've heard and used about in, a, in, in Sri Lanka where a case of, of a bus being stopped where all the Tamils were getting taken off the bus and a Sinhalese woman sitting next to a stranger who is a Tamil man just picked up his hand and held it as if she was as if they were married and in that way averted his death um, as the others were getting carried off. Those small times where there's an opportunity to shift a, a system in ways that individuals make all the time. And that I think is really significant about some of the stories that you tell in your book as well. Oh, well, that's interesting. I, first of all, I love that you moved from cleaning products to genocide in one sentence. I love that. And I think this is the thing that I find so rare in, in a lot of the books on conflict. It's like either or, right? It's either like a negotiation between the union and labor. And it's like, kind of feels very like clinical and, you know, or, or it's a genocide, right? But in fact, humans are humans and the systems change, the cultures change, the level of weaponry changes, uh, the level of trauma changes, power changes, but, but the human piece of it is very strikingly consistent, isn't it? Um, so, and, and it sounds like what you're hinting at is the ways in which they interact, right? Like I often find sometimes when I'm doing interviews about my own book is people will say, well, this is all fine for interpersonal conflict, but like, what about the system? And what about racism? And what about power? And what about, you know, and, and, and you know, it, it's so hard to, it, for me, and maybe you can help me answer that, because uh, I don't see them as separate. Like, I, I don't see them as like, you either have to work on fixing a corrupt system <laughs> that's oppressive, or work on like, interior conflict and interpersonal conflict. Like I, I feel like it's, you said this to me earlier, you put it well, so well, I wrote it down. Individuals shape systems and systems shape individuals. Like you can't really separate them as much as I'd like to. I'd like to just fix all the systems and then we can work on like my argument with my husband. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But uh, I don't know that we have that choice, right? This would be wonderful to open up because I know that there's people in, in this space as well who have um, extensive experience internationally as well as 
domestically who have recognized that there are, that how individuals really um, do have the power to shift systems uh, when, when, they're, when they have the roles to be able to do that. And I think what's really significant around so much around the climate crisis as well is that there's a, a concern and a fear so that automatically that sense of threat really reduces the, the, the options, the sense of pressure, and then a demand to be creative at the same time, which is also very difficult. And then there's also the absence of many roles to be able to insert oneself and influence the system. So I have a role as a recycler. Uh, so that's <laughs> not, not a super satisfying role. Fully inadequate to the task. Yes. Right? Yes, and so then there, there, and I think this is where there's there's some interesting work that can be further done is to be able to to think about the individual. So there's people like Mark Carney who's influencing in individuals and in shifting billions of dollars of capital into other kinds of investments. So in that way, using mm -hmm. his influence to be able mm -hmm. to shift significant systems forward but how we find the roles and how individuals do shape systems. And then sometimes they're deeply oppressed by them and sometimes the system imposes and yet there's still individual choices and capacity for discernment within those spaces. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, let's, let's do open it up with people have questions um, or thoughts or stories to tell of their own. I mean, I, I do, I would just add that this is something I, I work on a lot with fellow journalists is like, especially in climate coverage, but other things as well, is like, how do you convey the threat without leaving people so hopeless and disempowered and despairing that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So I often hear from people in the US who are saying, you know, well, there's nothing we can do. We have a dysfunctional Congress, we have, you know, this and that, and, you know, I can't, recycling is not gonna, uh, <laughs> It's not going to cut it and it has to be collective action and nobody's willing to. Uh, and so they talk themselves all the way fully around to being totally disempowered. And then when I talk to people in other countries who, who actually have dramatically less power, um, it's just heartbreaking, you know, to hear their, their feeling about that lack of agency, right? Um, like Americans still have quite a bit of power compared to a lot of other places. And even if it's not enough, even if it's inadequate, I do think that sometimes the journalism and the sort of negative bias and the outrage bias uh, creates a self-fulfilling prophecy where people just give up. Um, so is, is there a way to tell these stories that leaves people feeling, um, you know, feeling just enough hope and agency to take action, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things going on in my mind in that response. And one is that I have a, a deep respect for indigenous ways of knowing and being and the importance of land and rights and title for indigenous nations in Canada. And that the process of circle and the process of settling a nervous system to be able to be together, as you talk about with the Baha'is as well, about how systems can be created to um, support creative thinking while sharing a sense of threat so that it is there's not this individualism that I think is is particularly problematic um, so that collective um, being together then that can support emergence and I also think that actually I'm just going to stop there because I think that is really important as ways forward oh the thing that you said about at your role as a journalist about that it isn't conflict that makes the good story. And I think that is, a, I had, I've worked as a journalist many years ago and I think that is a problem, but I loved what you said about being, how to make a story more complicated or complex and introduce the drama of everyday variants in ways that people may not have thought of before. And it's that kind of variance rather than like the active conflicts some cognitive dissonance, those are interesting things that activate curiosity. And to the degree that curiosity can become activated rather than as some of my friends say as a kind of hydraulic valuing, okay? We already know we're gonna be outraged. So here's the, the repeat of this story about outrage. We're gonna have an outrage story now. Okay, now we're gonna have a, a fear story and here's the fear story. So it's just this, like it's this hydraulic um, 
So the other narratives that, that are able to be brought in, I think are, are super important and not in a kind of a cheesy good news story. That's like, that nobody really wants to read those either. So you, with that pause, shall we open it to uh, the thoughtful people in the room? Absolutely. I guess people can type their question. Oh, Hilary, perfect. And I can just unmute people as we go. Here. Yeah, please, please introduce yourselves. Hi there. Hi, Marnie. Very excited for you. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you, Amanda, for being here. Um, I just want to comment on what you had just last said, Marnie. Uh, I'm a, a associate professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability and an eco-psychologist. And so this conversation about connectedness and, uh, you know, what we do with our feeling effect is really uh, critical, I think. I don't think we've really done a good job of creating spaces of conflict, which, you know, we need those spaces so that we don't do this. <laughs> you know, we need space that we can actually, you know, kind of wrestle with things and, and bring our full climate range of emotions, if, if, if you will. Uh, and, and witness that in each other. There's a deep responsibility here to witness that so that, and that fits with indigenous ways of being and knowing, I think, Marnie, when you're talking about, you know, circles and, and sitting with what's really difficult, especially with people's motivations who might run counter to our own. And I'm just finding that more and more, you know, it's the old adage, if you don't cry when you have to, you feel crappy. You know, how much of that can we take of tamping things down, especially when we think of institutions where it's inappropriate to bring what Nora Bateson now calls the warm data. I love her for that. You know, we've had the cold data. Now we need to bring the feeling affect in ways that honors the full human experience. And if we don't do that, we won't have the energy. I, I tie that directly to the energy that we need to do the work we need to do in a world that is in you know, dark, difficult trouble. Because if we're not freeing ourselves up, if we can't let some of those emotions out in a responsible way, my experience has been, we just get depleted and exhausted and everything starts to look too big. You know? um, so it's kind of like a soul hygiene. <laughs> I see it as uh, you know, keeping ourselves really clean and to do that together, we need each other for that. I don't think we've set ourselves up well for that. So. I'm just so grateful for your book, Marnie. We've sat in circles together and I've witnessed you and you've witnessed me. And I'm just so grateful for those practices. And they're not all that popular. People don't say, sign me up. I'd like to come and weep with you or I'd like to come and you know, have a moment with you. And I think it's really important. So anyways, mostly gratitude, a little bit of commentary. But Thank you, thank you, Hillary. And what you say also resonates for how I think um, conflict capacity can be reframed so that we're actually building capacity for conflict and right. how do we be more conscientious in conflict and I think that there is a tendency to think about conflict resolution as a kind of a dampening down and in mm -hmm. some ways it can be a fawning a kind of a premature closure towards conflict towards the end of conflict but building capacity to hold the tension of conflict so that other possibilities can emerge I think is a is a practice and recently, a colleague of mine, Danica Straith, has started to talk about conflict stewardship rather than conflict management, about how to generate possibilities within a, a complex ecosystem of conflict to really think about all the ways that conflict can emerge. Well, and I say never waste a good crisis. You know, yum, I say. These troubling times, these are our perfect times for us to work this, to really find our way together. I don't think we've done a good job of this so far. So I love that reframing. Thank you for that. Stewardship, right? Spaces that we can actually be authentic and, and bring our full feelings. Anyways, thanks you two. I'll leave it to someone else I could go on. I mean, I love this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations, Marnie. Yeah, I appreciate what, what you're saying, Hillary, is we need to have space to express emotion. And otherwise, I mean, you mentioned how you, you can end up sort of tuning out or being seeing everything as negative and mm -hmm. just sort of having a depressed worldview, which I see a lot of people struggling with. 
Um, and actually in Canada and the US right now, 40% of people say they often or sometimes avoid the news because it leaves them feeling so dispirited. That's not great for a democracy, right? To have four out of 10 people actively avoiding contact with the news. Although I totally understand it and sympathize and, and among the 40% often. Um, but the other thing that happens, right? In addition to avoidance, and it's like a nice analogy for conflict writ large is that people will, uh, the emotion leaks out, right? So a lot of what I'm seeing, and I'm sure you all are too, is people will find a target of convenience. So they all those pent up, sadness or fear, or rage, and a lot of it to do with the pandemic, which I feel like has never been properly um, processed in, in this country anyway, or in my corner of the country, because it's it never ends, right? So like it's very hard to recover from a disaster that never ends or feels like it never ends. So, um, so people then, it's like, it's like electricity in the air and people find an explanation. And there are plenty of conflict entrepreneurs uh, in, who will help you find an explanation, who will give you a narrative that explains how you're, why you're feeling so terrible. And, and it's usually a simplified reductionist othering kind of narrative. And so unless, unless those emotions are able to come out in some more healthy way um, that isn't about us versus them, then they will find a target. And I'm, I'm, it is just, it is incredibly heartbreaking, right? To keep hearing this same story over and over from people I know and love whose nonprofits or schools or churches are being literally, people are just kind of destroying themselves from the inside because they, they want some way to win. Uh, and so they'll fight the fight they can fight like a proxy battle, even if that's not really actually the cause of, of the larger despair. Marnie, like before, have... yeah, oh, I, I see a question in the chat from Rob. Can Marnie speak to any three examples of big conflict we might all be familiar with and what one change to each she might recommend a conflict toward not toward? So yesterday I was speaking with a Ukrainian uh, student at Royal Roads who uh, in, in a conflict class who just said, you know, people come in and they, in the, he's speaking of family and communities where he's from. And it's, it's almost, um, well, it's insensitive to that they come in with kind of their tools for reconciliation and they have no idea what, what uh, is really going on. And so, um, Rob, I think one of the things about, about insight method that, that uh, I talk about in the book is that we really do, and, and that colleagues of mine, Megan Price in particular talks about, is we do need to find context specific answers coming from people who, when they are not so contracted by threat can actually think about other possibilities. And so it's not so much who I would be to nudge them, but who they would need to, how they would need, what process might they need to be able to develop their own solutions that can help. I can't do their thinking for them, but in uh, when, because everybody's knowledge and their valuing is incomplete, when they have an opportunity to have more authentic interactions, then the greater, there's a greater possibility for something that can shift the system. So that would be sort of the, an overall approach that I would offer. Amanda, do you want to say anything? And then we can go to John Radford. No, let's go ahead. That, yeah, let's try to get as much, many voices in here as we can. Um, uh, thank you. I just want to thank you for being able to be here. And Moni, your book, has made a really significant contribution. And I want to tie what I want to say to what you're asking, Amanda, is this link between almost people being overwhelmed by complexity. And how, how, do, we, how do we approach it? And, and when we're overwhelmed, what happens? So, so when I look at it um, in, our, in our world, as it's evolving, uh, individuals are being more and more exposed to the complexity, be it environment, be it whatever's going on around us. And that's to do with social media and there's all that, all that exposure. 
And I think what happens is if I am exposed to complexity and feel overwhelmed, I will tend to find and built into me, built into my, my literally my brain functioning. I will tend to find a simple solution. I need it. Um, that's the way we built. And it goes back to that part of my brain that's, that's processing that. So, so that's normal. That's a normal response. So it's one of the reasons why I will find targets, why there will be conspiracy theories, because it's a way for me personally to simplify my world. The problem with that is we're becoming increasingly biased, polarized, we add all the words you want, and less able to process content. Now, why Marnie's book is so valuable is because uh, where she started, where we started this conversation, it goes from the individual, not just the individual, but the interiority, what's going on inside of us. And by simply processing argument, it's just beautiful because if we can do that, what that does and what the book does as well is it helps us hold the tension, the inner tension, of the conflict. And in a way, it, it really is the solution. It's why at the individual level, it ultimately goes through to the genocide, goes through to those bigger pictures, uh, because that's where it actually counts. And so by focusing on argument, which is we're all involved in them every day, um, uh, is actually building that capacity. And Moni, your book does that. Um, Thank you, John. Matt, did you want to say anything in response to that? Um, it just reminds me of like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think what I often think about the psychological term splitting, which um, people will do when they're dealing with extreme levels of uncertainty and anxiety and pain. And I think yet starting from the unit of argument, as you're saying, makes it so we all can kind of access the complexity and the layers of conflict, right? Um, which I think makes, could, at least for me, it made me more curious about bigger macro conflicts, which also have these layers. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is something we can all relate to and is also directly related to the bigger conflicts. It also makes me think another colleague, um, Jamie Price, has taught me that, um, that bias is the absence of relevant questions. And I think it's a great definition for bias that myself, when I'm not able to ask a question or when there's an absence of other questions within a community or in, with, between groups about each other, that that is a, a, it's the, the symptom of bias and it's the, the, the shutting down and the when there's only certainty and no curiosity is really when conflict can, conflict behaviors are enacted. Because again, I started with to say conflict takes hold and conflict doesn't take hold, conflict behaviors are enacted. And I think that is really important to, to keep remembering that it is about behaviors that people do because then it becomes so much easier to think about other decisions that people can make. Ken Melchin. Unmute. Hi. Um, this is great. Marnie, as you know, I, ha I had the privilege of being um, on your thesis committee. And so this project that is now your book, um, when it first started, um, we were there together. Um, and right from the get go, I was astonished at the degree of self awareness that you had in being able to um really probe your feelings but not just your feelings what your mind is doing at certain moments of times when typically we're overwhelmed by emotion and feeling but you were able to um not only were you able to do that but you actually got better and better and better at doing that as the research of the thesis and then the subsequent years that led to the final publication of the book. You, you've gotten extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily gifted at doing that. And my question is this, um, how do you, you yourself, teach it? It's a great question. Um, 
and I think it is uh, teachable. It's a practice of reading others' works and of being in the company of people um, to be able to have the kind of insight conversations so that I think that um, when the, the skills that of, of asking curious questions that are targeted at valuing and connected to deciding about what matters and what, what were you thinking when you did that and what made that the better decision, it does offer the opportunity to slow down. And I think through that process, I've noticed other people being able to do that too because we talk about reflection and reflective practice quite a bit. And it's a little bit of a, it's not very precise, but to be able to think about, to, to, to wonder what it is that I'm doing when I'm doing that, I think is very, very helpful. So you've got me thinking now, as you can tell. And so I'm also interested, you know, Amanda, and what, what your thoughts are. And then that may be another longer, a longer question uh, to, to respond to. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the question is like, how do you teach that? And how do you help more people access this? Because not everybody's going to have a mediator or uh, an experience or training, formal training. Um, when I train journalists, we try to, um, it, it's, it's actually what we found to be most effective <laughs> is starting with how they cover conflict. Like how could we cover conflict differently? And then eventually they start to apply it, actually quickly, they start to apply it to their own internal life and to their personal life and to their conflicts within the newsroom. But with journalists, and not everybody's like this, it's hard to come at it head on and, and, and just say, hey, we're gonna have a workshop on how you navigate conflict and how to do it better in your own life and, or workplace. Um, I think a lot of professions and people are able to do that, but sometimes it's, it's better to come at it sideways, right? Mm -hmm. And so we talk about, well, how could we cover the abortion conflict or gun control? And we talk a lot about what is the understory driving this conflict? What are different questions we can ask people when we're interviewing? Who are different sources that we can find, different archetypes for sources? And we demonstrate a lot of that and we play a lot of like clips and show a lot of examples, show, don't tell. And then, if, and then what you see, and this is the best part, right, is when people not only start using those practices in their reporting, but start to find a lot of uh, delight and uh, freedom in trying to use them in their own personal lives. So uh, we know from like Aaron Halpern's research, research on conflict in Israel that coming at things through analogy or obliquely is often a more effective way, particularly in entrenched conflict with people who have a lot of defenses um, in place or a, a real resistance to vulnerability. What you say there also makes me think that maybe one of the next steps, and we can think about this too, but is to, to have a conversation with Gary Friedman, because you cover his work so nicely in the book about being able to ask questions and go down the why, take the why train and look at the understory. And it seems to me that the, the, the special sauce about that is to how to animate or activate people's curiosity towards themselves and towards the interiority of others, because that is easy to train about being able to ask the kinds of questions that will target valuing and help people move from a more contracted place to a more expansive place. And then in catching themselves in doing that, it's more likely that they can do that again. So that I think is, is a skill that I've learned and that it's it's and I think that is the once people start pausing and wondering and reflecting, then then we know that they've animated, then their curiosity is being animated. And in a mediation situation, that's wonderful because when someone's question curiosity is animated towards themselves, often that sparks an animation in others. Curiosity is contagious, as Amanda talks about. Brian. Monroe. Hi guys. Uh, my name is Brian. Um, I'm a First Nations guy, but uh, I was raised in Southwest Manitoba with a foster family, um, English. Um, 
grew up, I married a, a woman from France, two kids, so our kids are Métis. Um, I actually didn't know about a lot of stuff before I came to um, Victoria, um, any of these conversations. Uh, I love my foster family. They're awesome, awesome people. Uh, marriages just end. Um, I don't know. I'd like to learn learn more for sure. Um, there's a lot to this, a lot to this country, for sure. Um, try to get along as best I can with everybody. Always been that way. Uh, I've been in trouble a few times with the law. Um, served my time. Um, with my foster family, I was always trying to better myself, um, to behave in a proper manner. Um, it's just what I've gotten out of life is always try to strive for better, try to not be bad, do bad things, just, yeah, try to better myself. Hmm. So. Brian? I'm so grateful for what you just shared in that like two minutes, you were able to like masterfully tell us something about who you are and the systems that you were a part of and how with the connection with your foster family and the encounters with the law that you just, you laid it out so beautifully in where where you are as a person in this trying to do better and so how that carries you and then the challenges and obstacles that you're facing and it's it was so beautifully done to be able to lay that out and that this like name it in this way of we all do need to learn more like that is really the way forward and one of my colleagues anyway, I can just go on, but I just, I'm just so grateful for the way that you just said that in, in just, in, in such eloquent, just so simple and, and beautiful. Thank you. And, and Amanda, I don't know if you want to say anything to that as well. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really struck by the emotion in your voice, um, Brian, and the, I can feel the, the weight and the work and think it, it's it's a good reminder of you know how hard this is like how hard it is to understand conflict in ourselves let alone in others right it is just yeah. really hard uncomfortable painful sometimes excruciating work um so i thank you for sharing that sure thanks for hearing me hmm. And I think, Amanda, you have to go. Thank you so much. <laughs> I do, but I hope the conversation continues. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Take what care. a gift it is to, to, uh, to spend this time with you. So. Go forward and do good. <laughs>
because people often talk about intention and I do that myself. If, if I, uh, if I'm in, if I'm causing harm, well, I, I didn't mean to, that wasn't my intention. And often it kind of sort of is, but not really. Um, and so intentions themselves are very com complex. So I wanted to explore that in more depth. And what I also loved about being able to do this under a very careful guidance by Janet Sultanen, who's a remarkable scholar, and uh, is also to be able to engage ethically and authentically with other people's interiorities, what it is that they know and value and decide. How do, how do they come to, to uh, do what they do in conflict? And that's tricky because I don't have the moment by moment and, and shift by shift um, access. So really the only way to access that is to do that process of writing and then check it with others and go back and think about it some more and write some more and see what the, how others respond to the writing. And through that process, um, develop stories over, over time. And it takes time to, to create a story and then to figure out what was really going on in it and how the complexity, then I got much better at being able to um, articulate and work with increasing levels of complexity to be able to, to really um, hold awareness of 30 interiorities in a room and recognize that how do we align those and how do we, when, when uh, ruptures occur, how to engage them to move a system forward. And I'm still learning about that. Um, there's a question from Tina about how to speak more about freezing and fawning behaviors, please. I think it can be very helpful in um, uh, recognizing that if I'm experience, if I'm discerning some kind of threat, if there's something that's registered in me as a, a concern or a fear or anger, some kind of gap that, that I, 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 I don't like, that um, if my habit has been to freeze, if I get stuck, that I'm not able to formulate any kind of response. Sometimes that's actually a very conscientious thing to do, to do nothing is actually like good to let time pass. Other times when it's habitual and I have no kind of sense of, I talk about in the book quite a bit about choiceless choices. When I don't have a sense of agency, I'm just stuck, then it isn't the most conscientious. It's kind of rash and I'm not able to do, I'm pretty constrained in it. And so that freezing behavior and then fawning is another one about being overly nice and overly accommodating in a way that tries to kind of mask or deflect harm from me. And Sometimes it's my own sense of like, I don't want to look like a bad person or I don't want other people to think badly of me or to have some kind of negative consequence. And so it's a kind of a conflict behavior. Sometimes it, when it's more conscientious, I am being nice. Other times it's kind of just like fawning conflict behavior. And there's a bunch of stuff that's not getting talked about or recognized in that kind of over niceness. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to add to that please put up your hand if, if, if you do. And then on the next question about thinking of how shame gets in the way as we look at our interiority. Yeah, the self-compassion to do our own work. Lee, I think that's such a good point. Um, and it's, uh, Brene Brown is really a, a master of talking about shame and that vulnerability is a part of it and the connection is another part that she talks about shame is really part of the isolating and one of the things that separates us from others and how shame can also be taking on the oppressor's view of us as my colleague John Radford talks about as well that 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 that's that that shame really is one of those core like humiliation that Amanda talks about in her book is something that is deeply important to to continue to work with I had a, a colleague um, who's did a great deal of study on um, um, de-radicalization and, and spent time um, speaking with um, people who had decided not to be fighters anymore in Northeastern Iraq. And what he discovered was one of the main drivers of radical uh, action is the sense of injustice. And so that sense of humiliation or shame and in the conversation, I said, well, they're not wrong. There is injustice, there's structural injustice. 
it's then the different options that become open to how to respond conscientiously to that sense of injustice because violence always does breed violence. And so what are the paths towards different kinds of engagement? Sometimes we do need to fight and how do we do that as conscientiously as we can to resist and to shift. And again, indigenous people within Canada have done this for generations, millennia of resistance uh, to other kind. well, I'd say colonization. So it's been hundreds of years of resistance. And just the fact that there are indigenous people like yourself, Brian, who continue to live and work and offer their gifts is a testament to generations of Indigenous people who have kept the seeds of culture alive and kept the teachings alive and have passed those on and they're tremendous acts of resistance that were not armed conflict. So there's other things to talk about in that and it's much more complex than that. But I do think, uh, Lee, when you talk about shame that there's so much to, uh, so much to continue to um, recognize that in ourselves and in others and how to this, this movement towards more trauma-informed and how to better integrate our own trauma and the trauma that that the the beings separated from each other can bring is, is really a path forward to, to shifting conflict. And Nancy has said in the in the chat is that if in, if you put in the chat what your most significant learning has been from today's session, then we'll draw one name and send you a book copy. So even if you have nothing that's extremely wise to say, um, please put in a word or two, something that, that caught your attention, um, but that's a really great way of framing it and very insighty there. What are some of the learning nuggets that you've, that, uh, that um, have been meaningful or memorable? And it also makes me feel like I've done something of value for you today, because you've certainly offered me a lot of gifts in, in your presence and in your attention and your support. Any other words from the floor as we go into our uh, opportunities to win prizes, big, big prize. Look at all that wisdom just popping up in the chat now. Nancy, would you like to close us in uh, in a way to welcome? Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Arnie. Thank you everyone for joining us. So I think I'll just stay on for a few more minutes, just the time that people write down, and then we'll connect with the person. We'll send you an email if you're the winner, and we'll uh, ask for your address and mail the book to you. But congratulations again, Marnie. I think that was a powerful and beautiful conversation. I see a lot of thank you in the, in the audience. Wonderful. We had many people online, many questions. So wonderful. Thank you all. And I am look for, looking forward to next steps, because I think these kinds of um, conversations often bring up a lot of questions and uh, and hopefully in you as well that you can kind of advance your curiosity in whatever fields they are, whether it's in, in supporting our environment or bringing more peace or artistry in amongst theater artists that there's so many of us in in the space who are doing amazing things. And so I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to be amongst a community of, of uh, such such good people. Thank you again, and we'll let people go. Feel free to, to stay on. I see people applauding, wonderful. And hopefully we'll see you all in another webinar. Thank you again, Marnie. Thank you. Great presentation.